Hello, Curran here. This video is an introduction to D3.js. Let's make a face. This is going to be sort of a hands-on introduction to using D3.js. And the target audience for this is folks who already know the basics of JavaScript, HTML, CSS, and SVG, and also have no prior experience with D3.js. So I'm going to introduce everything from scratch, sort of from the ground up, how to use d3.js. These are the topics we're going to cover in this video. Loading d3.js into our HTML page, importing d3 functions with ES6, creating a face, like a smiley face sort of thing, with SVG and d3, and then finally doing a little bit of animation with transitions. Before diving into that, though, I just want to discuss briefly what D3 is. D3 stands for Data Driven Documents. This is a JavaScript library uh, written by Mike Bostock. Um, it lets you create data visualizations in the browser, but fundamentally, it's a low, sort of relatively low level library, meaning you sort of end up down in the details of the math behind data visualizations. And also, it doesn't contain any uh, like abstractions for making graphics. It just lets you use SVG or Canvas or whatever you want uh, to make the visualizations. It's important to realize also that data visualization has been around a really long time, way, way before D3 came about. But D3 is, is what I'm using to teach data visualization because I feel like it's the most powerful thing out there right now. I mean, there's other libraries that lets you make charts and graphs like uh, Python libraries, R libraries, but um, D3 brought data visualizations to the web. And I think that's so powerful. And also with D3, you can add interactions and sort of infinite customizability to your works. So that's a little bit of the background of D3. Now let's dive in and uh, get our hands dirty. The first thing we need to do to use D3 is load it into our HTML page. I'm going to use VizHub to do this development. So you can follow along by going to vizhub.com. I'm going to start by navigating to this shapes with SVG and CSS example from the previous video and forking this by clicking on fork. Then I'll sort of gut this. I'll remove everything that we had from before, although the body CSS we do want to keep. And then I'll just remove all of this from the page except the outer SVG element, which I would like to keep. And I'll change the title to Let's Make a Face with D3.js. Now, to load any script, any JavaScript library or file onto the page, you can use a script tag. So I'll make a begin script tag, end script tag. And we're going to load D3 from a CDN, Content Distribution Network. And uh, the most popular, from what I can tell, CDN nowadays is Unpackage. You can check it out by going to unpkg.org, or no, .com, <laughs> unpackage.com. What this does is it packages up libraries that are found on NPM, the Node Package Manager. And uh, hey, look at that. They even have D3 as one of the examples. So you can access unpackage.com slash D3 and it will actually redirect you to the minified version of the latest version of D3, which happens to be exactly what we want to include on our page. We can copy this URL here, and then back in our code, we can say, all right, the SRC, the source of this script tag, is in quotes, and we can paste that URL there. So what this does is introduce a global variable called D3. And to test this out, just to do a test that we have D3 in our environment, 
we can make another script tag at the bottom of the body element and then in this script tag we can say console.log d3 and to see this we need to open up the dev tools with control shift J or in this menu here now we can see that this is what gets printed out this is the d3 object and see it's got all of these functions available on it the first d3 function that we'll use is d3.select this will create a d3 selection which is a, an, a kind of object that we're going to learn a lot about but for now just imagine it's sort of a wrapper around a DOM element and what we're going to do is select our SVG element using D3 in this script tag. So we can say D3.select and select takes as input a string which is the same sort of selector string that you see in CSS. So to select all SVG elements on the page we can just pass in SVG. Now that we've got this selection we can assign it to a variable so I'll say const SVG equals d3.select svg and again just to sort of test that this is working what we can do is set an inline style on this svg element to set say the background color to red just to make sure that our code is actually working to set an inline style on this element we can say svg.style this is a method available on d3 selections and this takes two arguments, the key and the value. The key in this case is background color and the value will be red. All right, it turned red. Success. To take a closer look at what kind of DOM manipulation uh, D3 has done here, we can right click and say inspect to inspect this element. And we can see that sure enough, it's an SVG element and the inline style, the CSS style, has been set to background color is red. All right, we've loaded D3 onto our page and we've done some basic DOM manipulation. And by the way, DOM is document object model. That's what gets created from these HTML tags and you can manipulate it with JavaScript. Now, let's move on to importing D3 functions using ES6. VizHub supports ES6 modules um, and let's make our index.js which is the entry point of our ES6 module bundling system here which is based on rollup. So we'll make a new file index.js and we can take the content from this script tag and delete it out of here. I'm going to cut it with control X and then go over to index.js and paste it in here. And then I'll, I'll fix the indentation by using control open square bracket to unindent. All right, now this is properly indented. And now that we've got index.js, see this bundle.js was created from that index.js by rollup, sort of behind the scenes. What we want to do is run this bundle.js inside of our index.html. So with this script tag, we can set the src, the source, equal to bundle.js. And now our rectangle turned red, so that means it's working. Back in our index.js, let's look at how we're using this d3 method, select. We're saying d3.select, but what we could do and this is, you know, in my experience, preferable. It makes the code cleaner overall, and it works with other bundling systems, um, is we can import select using ES6 module syntax. What this is going to look like when we invoke it is just select SVG. No more D3 dot. But we need to get select into our scope here by using import. So we can say import begin curly brace select and curly brace from, in quotes, D3. 
This is how we can use ES6 syntax to import the select module from D3. Just as a bit of background, um, typically module bundlers um, import packages from NPM, but VizHub is sort of optimized to work on the web, so what it's doing is when you import select from D3, it actually looks to the D3 global object for this, uh, this variable select. And we can just take a look briefly at bundle.js. See, it passes in the D3 global object and then uses D3.select internally. So it's effectively the same as what we had before, but it just allows us to use this nice ES6 import syntax. All right, we've covered the nitty gritty mechanics of loading D3.js and importing D3 functions using ES6. Now, let's get to the fun part of creating a face with SVG and D3. When I say make a face, this is the kind of thing that I'm thinking of, like a standard smiley face, and maybe we can add some eyebrows. All right, so what's the first sort of basic element of a face? Maybe it's the background circle, and we can make it yellow to sort of make it standard. Uh, one thing that's different about what we did last time, last time we modified the um, index.html and put the circle elements inside here, but now what we're going to do is we're going to do it all in JavaScript using D3. Now that we've got this selection on SVG, on this SVG element, we can actually put new elements inside of it and then style those elements and set all their attributes. So first off, I'm going to delete this red background color and then we can make a circle inside of this SVG element. For that, we can use svg.append. Append is another useful method on D3 selections that will append new DOM elements. So let's use this to append a circle element. We can pass in the string circle, which is the tag name, and then this will cause D3 to create a new circle element, and this actually is returned uh, by this method called append. So what we could do is say, all right, let's make a new variable, const circle equals svg.append circle. And we're not seeing anything because we haven't set the radius or the cx or cy or anything. So to do that, we can say circle.attr, which is short for attribute. This is another method on D3 selections that takes as input two arguments. The first argument is the attribute itself. So we're going to set the r attribute, which stands for radius. And then the second argument is the value that gets assigned to that radius. So we can say we can make it a radius of 200 pixels, and then the circle shows up. Sweet. And just to make it super clear how this maps into the DOM structure, we can inspect this element and have a look. See, when we call svg.append, it creates a new circle element as a child of svg, the, the parent element. And then when we say .attr r is 200, this is what, how it translates into the DOM structure. r equals 200, just like we had before in our HTML. Let's position this circle to be in the middle, because this is going to be like the background circle of our smiley face. For that, we can set another attribute. I'm going to copy paste that and change r to be cx. And OK, cx is 200. That moves it sort of halfway there. Our width is 960, so I can use math here to say 960 divided by 2. This will center it exactly in the middle of the screen. And we can do the same for CY. I'm going to copy paste that, change CX to CY. And then I know, I remember our height is 500, so I'm going to say, all right, make the center Y coordinate to be 500 divided by 2. Now that we've got it centered, I'm going to tweak the radius so that it sort of fills up the available space. All right, 300 is too much. How about 250? Yeah, that looks about right. And you know, we can set that 
to be 500 divided by 2 because 500, the height, is sort of the limiting factor that limits how large this can be. So I'm going to set this to be 500 divided by 2. Since we're in JavaScript, we're not limited by the bounds of HTML. You know, we can have things like variables for our width and height. So why not? I mean, why not make this code more clear? And instead of 500, we can say height divided by 2. But first, we need to define height. So we can say const height equals 500, like that. So wherever we have 500, like when we're setting the CY, we can use height there. And the same thing for width. 960 is our width, so we can replace that by width. And we can say, all right, const width equals 960. But you know what? We're already defining the width and height in index.html. See, SVG width and height is 960 and 500. So rather than define it in two places, let's just define it here and extract these values from our SVG element. We can do that by accessing ATTR on SVG. So we can say SVG.ATTR, and if you just call ATTR with no arguments, it returns back the value of the attribute that you specify. So I'm going to specify, all right, we want the value of the width at attribute. So what this does is it extracts the value of the width attribute from SVG, our SVG element, which is 960. So this is how we can use .ettr to get values out. And we can do the same thing for the height attribute. I'll just copy paste that, change width to height. When you extract values like this, it's important to know what type of thing that you're dealing with. So just to check that, I'm just going to say console.log width, and then take a look at what that value is. Huh, it's 960. The, the number, I can say type of to check the type. But see, this is, it's actually a string. It's not a number. Because JavaScript is so sort of lenient with types, it actually converts, it parses the string into a number right here. But just as a general, as a good practice, best practice, it's best to parse strings into numbers as early as possible. So what we can do here is, instead of just assigning width to be this string value, we can say, parse float to parse this string into a number. So now the type of width is number. It's called parse float because it parses the string into a floating point number. A commonly used shorthand for parse float is just plus, the unary plus operator. This basically does the same thing. It parses a string into a number. And with this unary plus, we can actually leave out these parentheses. This is the pattern that you'll commonly see in uh, D3 examples. You may be wondering, why does this return a string in the first place? And I'd say it's sort of a quirk of how HTML works. I mean, this just gets defined as a string. I think all attributes in HTML are defined as strings. So if you extract their values, even if it makes sense that you know they should be a number, these are all strings in the DOM. That's just sort of how it is. All right, so we've got a basic circle. We're extracting the width and height from our SVG. There is a lot of duplication here. We're saying circle dot, circle dot, circle dot. It turns out that the dot ATTR function it returns the D3 selection that it was called on. So we can actually chain these. So we can say circle.attr, and then instead of having a semicolon, we can just continue that statement and say dot .attr. This is called method chaining. And because dot .attr returns circle, we can just sort of chain these like this. With chaining, we can actually combine this with our statement down below. I'm going to cut that, 
paste it down here, and then combine this together. And this is the sort of D3 method chaining pattern that you'll see most commonly. Let's make this circle yellow. For that, we can say dot attr fill. We can just pass in yellow because we can pass in any named color. Oh man, that's that's kind of too bright. Or maybe it just needs an outline around it. It just sort of is striking. So let's make an outline by setting the stroke attribute. Let's set the stroke to be black. Yeah, now it sort of pops a little bit more. Next, let's make the eyes. For the eyes, we can append more circles to our SVG. So I'm going to copy paste this whole block here and say um, left eye. I'm going to call this left eye. And um, for the radius, I'm going to use a smaller value, like maybe 10 pixels. So see, we've got this small circle now in the middle. And I'm just going to fill this with black. We're going to have little black beady eyes. And so we don't need a black stroke anymore. And I think I'll make it a little bit bigger, let's say 30 pixels. All right. So now we've got sort of a cyclops smiley face with no mouth. This is supposed to be the left eye. So let's subtract some quantity from the x coordinate. We can say, OK, it's width divided by 2, which takes us to the center, minus, let's say, 20 pixels. All right, that moves it a little bit. Let's move it by, like, I don't know, 60 pixels or 100 pixels. There we go. That's more, like, to the left. And let's move this eye up a little bit by subtracting some value from the y coordinate. Like, if we subtract 20, it moves it up a little bit, maybe 50, 70. That looks good. All right, we've got a left eye. Now let's add the right eye. I'm going to copy paste this whole block. And ins instead of subtracting 100, we can add 100 to make it go to the right. And I've got to rename this variable to be right eye. All right, we've got our left eye and our right eye. So far, so good. But I smell duplicated logic. We've got 100 here and 100 here. Why not make this into a variable too? Something like, I don't know, i spacing. So let's make a new variable. We can say const i spacing is 100. And we use it there and this other place as well. We're also duplicating 70, which is, I would say, the y offset of the eyes. So we can say, all right, it's going to be minus i offset, or i y offset. And we can make that a new variable. Const i y offset is 70. Or actually, it's minus 70. So we can say, all right, it's height divided by 2 plus i y offset. And we can do the same down here. All right, we're pretty close to a smiley face. The only thing that we need now is the mouth, the actual smiley nature of this. To make the mouth, we can use D3 arc. And you know, I always have to Google this. And uh, Googling the D3 API is something you'll need to do frequently. So from the top, from D3.js, we can click on documentation here, which will take us to the D3 API documentation, which I find myself consulting frequently. Under resources, you need to click through to API reference here, which contains a list of all the functions of D3. And I happen to know that the thing that we need is in the shapes package. See here under shapes, there's a section for arcs. And this is really what we want. So if I click through here, See, it's actually in the D3 shape package. And this is the documentation for arcs, which we can use to generate the uh, mouth of our smiley face. The first step is to import the arc function 
from D3. So we can say import select comma arc from D3 to import both of these functions into our scope. Next, let's make a path element for the mouth. We can say const mouth equals svg.append a path element. And on this path element, we'd like to set the attribute d to be this um, path string generated by d3.arc. So let's again consult the documentation for how to do this. It looks something like this. We call arc to construct an arc generator, and then on that arc generator, we can pass in these things like inner radius, outer radius, start angle, and end angle. So in here, we can say arc to create our arc generator, and then we can invoke that, which is a function, uh, and we can pass in an object that has these things. So I'm going to paste what I saw in the documentation, inner radius, outer radius, start angle, and end angle, and I'll indent these. Nothing is showing up here because it's actually off the screen, but if we change the end angle to pi, we can see that, all right, there it is, there's our arc, and to make it sort of like a, a smile, we can change the inner radius to something other than zero. That gives us like a donut sort of a shape. So if we set it to say 80, there's our arc in the corner. So the first order of business is making it so that it's aligned with the center of our smiley face. For that, we can use a group element, which can contain this path and then transform that group element. So let's say const g for the group element is svg.append. And then instead of appending mouth to svg, we can append it to g. On this group element is where we can set the attribute transform to be a string where we can translate by some x and y. So let's say just translate it by 250 pixels to the right, see how it moved. And then the y coordinate will be say 200. And so, all right, we're getting closer. We're getting closer. Let's get this actually into the right place by using a string template literal with the backticks and then putting our variable values in here. We're going to want to use these same values, width over 2 and height over 2. So we can translate it by, we can use the syntax dollar sign, open and close curly brace, and then paste a JavaScript expression into there. See, now it's centered exactly, horizontally. And we can do the same for the Y coordinate, but instead of width over 2, this would be height over 2. This looks like a nose more than a mouth. So let's fix the start and end angle to make it look like a mouth. Let's try math.py divided by 2. No, well, let's change this start angle to be math.py divided by 2 and see where that gets us. We just need to sort of tweak things. Um, let's make the end angle math.py. Uh, well, let's figure out what is zero in the start angle. So if we have it as zero, it's actually up there at the top. And if we have it as math.pi divided by two, I think that's where we want it to start. Okay. All right, so the top is zero. This is pi over two. This is pi. So I think we want the end angle to be like pi times um, three over two. Yeah, there we go. All right, it's now sort of resembling a face. And we can tweak the inner radius and outer radius to make it look more like a face. See, this is where this really becomes fun because you can really, you know, create faces with different personalities. Before we move on any further, though, I want to address one thing that I see as a problem, or it sort of smells like technical debt creeping up, and that is we have 
width over 2 and height over 2 repeated, you know, a bunch of times, more times than is really necessary. What I propose we do is put everything inside this group element, not just the mouth, so that we can leverage the fact that it's transformed or translated by width over 2 and height over 2. It's put in the center. What I'm going to do is move this block of code to the top of the file. And then for our circle, instead of appending it to SVG, I'm going to append it to G. And this will allow us to just delete these two lines of code because the default CX and CY is zero and relative to its parent group element, which is translated by width over 2 and height over 2, um, CX and CY of 0 will be perfectly fine. It'll put this circle in the center. And we can do the same thing for the left eye. We can just append that to our group element, and then we can get rid of width over 2 and height over 2, and that actually simplifies our code to be just code that's actually concerned with the eye. We can do the same thing for the right eye, append it to the group element, get rid of the width and height logic. There we go. Our code is a little bit simpler and cleaner now after this refactoring. And you know, I'm noticing also 30 is repeated, so I'm just going to extract this into a variable as well. We can call this i radius and use it in both places. Now we can easily tweak the i radius by just changing one line of code. Another sort of room for improvement here is that there's duplicated logic with the CY and the fill for both of these eyes. You know, we could set these in one place if the eyes were both part of the same group element. So let's do that. Let's create a new variable. We'll say const eyes group, or eyes g for short. And that can be g.append g. No problem with having nested group elements. And instead of appending the left and right eyes to g, we can append them to eyes g. And what we can do now is move this fill. Well, actually, you know what? We can just, we can just delete that fill because the default fill is black. But with the CY, we can use the same uh, transform, translate logic as we are using for the other group element. I'm going to copy paste that and say, okay, our transform here will just be translating by zero in the X direction. And in the Y direction, it'll be translating by I, Y offset. Now we can delete these lines of code that set CY for both of our eyes. All right, now that we've got the eyes, the mouth, these are all the basic elements, let's add some eyebrows. I think it makes sense to put the eyebrows in the eyes group so that we get the translate from that. So let's make these as rectangles. We can say const left eye brow, or I guess I think eyebrow is a word, so we don't need to capitalize that B there. We can set that to be eyes g dot append a rect. And on this rect element, we need to set the x, y, width, and height attributes. So we can start by setting the width and since we're going to have two eyebrows that both have the same width, let me use a variable. I'll call it eyebrow width. Then I'll make a new variable. Eyebrow width is, let's say, 50. We can tweak it later. And same thing with height. I'm going to make a new variable called eyebrow height. And the eyebrow height, let's say, 20. I don't know how that's going to look. And then we can also set the height attribute of our eyebrow, our left eyebrow, to be eyebrow height. And I think I forgot these dots here. 
All right, we've got a rectangle that is sort of like an eyebrow, but it needs to be above the eyes. Since this is the left eyebrow, we can use um, X to move it to the left. We can say dot ATTR X is, let's just put some number in here, like, I don't know, minus 50 or minus uh, 200. You know what, actually we can leverage eye spacing because we already have a variable for that and we want the eyebrows to always be above the eyes no matter where they are. So we can use eye spacing. We can say X is negative eye spacing. All right, that gets us closer to the eye. Now let's move it up by using the Y attribute. We can say dot ECTR Y is going to be some number, I don't know, 40. Um, remember, as y increases, it goes down, but we want it to go up. So what if we use like minus 60? All right, it's getting into eyebrow territory now. Since we want this to be centered with respect to the eye, we can actually compute um, the x and width differently. We can say, all right, the x is going to be minus eye spacing um, we need to subtract half the width. So minus eye spacing minus eyebrow width divided by two. That will make it centered above the eye. Now we're in a position to tweak um, eyebrow width and make it like, I don't know, 70. And we make it eyebrow height maybe 10 or um, let's say 15. And before we even make the right eyebrow, I'm going to factor out this constant 70 into a variable. Let's call this variable eyebrow y offset. Now we can make the right eyebrow by copy pasting this block for the left eyebrow and then renaming it to be right eyebrow. And the only real difference is instead of minus eye spacing, we want the x to be plus or positive eye spacing. All right, we've pretty much done it. We've made a face with D3 and SVG. Next, let's add a little bit of animation with transitions to get a flavor of um, animation with D3. What I'd like to do here is make these eyebrows move up and down. I think that would be super cool. Let's start by making one of the eyebrows move in some way. What we can do here is we can add a transition. We can say dot transition, which will create a D3 transition. And then within this transition, we can set attributes to different values. So I think what we would like to set is the Y attribute. And let's set that to be eyebrow offset uh, minus something like let's say 30. And did you see that? It raised up a little bit in a smooth way. Let's slow that down by adding a duration. We can add a duration to the transition by saying dot duration and then we can pass in a number of milliseconds like let's say 2000 to make it happen over two seconds. So I'll tweak that to make it go up even more. You can see it move. See that? This brings into focus something with D3 that's quite unique to D3, and that is the indentation patterns. Typically, statements that create a new selection or transition are indented by two spaces, and statements like ATTR that modify an existing selection or transition are indented by two spaces. This makes it more readable. So you can see which things create a new, you know, context for dealing with, and then which things just modify an existing context. So now I think I'll just change all the code to, to strictly follow that pattern so that it's easier to read. Transitions in D3 can easily be chained, meaning, you know, one transition happens after another. So we can actually make this eyebrow go back down by creating another transition and setting the Y attribute to just be what it was before. See, so now it goes up and it goes back down. 
it kind of, you know, shows some nice attitude that only one of these gets raised, but the original vision was that both eyebrows would be raised together. So let's make that happen. Just like we made a group for the eyes, we can make a new group for the eyebrows, and we can actually set the transition on the transform of that group element. What I'm going to do is copy this logic that creates the eyes group, and then create a new group, call it I browse. And instead of transforming by I Y offset, I'm going to use I brow Y offset, which we have not defined yet. So I'm going to define that here. Const I brow Y offset. Oh no, it is defined. It is defined there. Ha, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> there it is. Now instead of appending the eyebrows to the eyes group, we can append these to the eyebrows group. And the same thing for the right eyebrow. Oh, I made a mistake. The eyebrows should not be appended to G, but they should be appended to the eyes group. There we go. <laughs> now he's really surprised. <laughs> now we can delete this logic from the individual eyebrows that sets the Y. So we don't need to set Y anymore and we can move this transition logic away from the right eyebrow and instead onto the eyebrows group. But instead of transitioning against Y, now we need to transition against the transform. So I'm going to copy paste this into here and then say, all right, subtract 50 here. And I'll do the same for this last one, which position it back to the original place. So not minus anything. And this is not working right now because um, we're calling dot append on eyebrows G, which is set actually to the transition. So with transitions, it, you can't really append things. So what we want to do is define eyebrows D, G just to be the re return value from this append right here. So what we should do is add the semicolon there, and then separately we want to apply these transitions to the eyebrows group. See now this dot append is appending to the eyebrows group, which is returned from this expression here, and all of this sort of takes place uh, separately. So now when this runs, both eyebrows, in fact, go up and down. All right, we've done it. We've made a face whose eyebrows go up and down. What I'd like you to do is fork this visualization and modify it in some way. Make it uh, your own, you know, make it express something different. And that would be a good exercise to learn D3. That's all that's in this video, Introduction to D3, Let's Make a Face. So thanks for watching, take care.